Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. We're starting a new uh, study today. And um, in preparations for this study, as I was looking at it, I did a Google search um, on self-help books. And so if you got the sermon note sheet, you already know what I'm going to say on this one. But I was astounded to find out that I got 5.1 billion results. 5.1 billion results. The self-help industry is an $11.6 billion industry in 2019. They're predicting that to be between 13 and 14 billion by next year. The self-help industry. There is so much money and so much time by Americans and then worldwide on this subject of making yourself better. Sadly, the next question comes in, and that is, where are people turning to find wisdom, knowledge, understanding, discernment, and discretion? And yes, I chose those words purposely. They're looking at the world and its relative truth. It's amazing to me, again, I talk about, it's amazing to me how much I see on Facebook, but it is amazing to me how much I see on Facebook, and what things are being sent through. And we are watching our nation right now being controlled with their thought processes in such an amazing way. I'm not making a comment on, on COVID, and I'm not making a comment on the, the, the protests that are going on right now. Maybe I am. And so, but I, I the world is being controlled with this mind control thing. And, the, 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 and I get that. Unbelievers will be unbelievers. They will think like unbelievers. Sinners are sinners are sinners. I used to be in that camp. I'm no longer in that camp. How sad it is then when we who are no longer in that camp, what? Talk like that, act like that, think like that. Go to them for the answers that they don't have. They didn't have it for years. They don't have it now. Rather, those answers have been given to us thousands of years ago. And they have stood the test of time. The book of Proverbs was written written over 2,500 years ago, between 2,500 and 2,800 years ago, by a, a small group of individuals. Yes, Solomon, he wrote most of those. But you see, there's also Agar and Lemuel. Agar is the Proverbs 30, and Lemuel are the the first so many verses of chapter 31. And so, God used them in an amazing way to write his word. So we know 2 Peter chapter 2, or verse 20 and 21, where it says, Knowing this first, that no what prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, this is an aside. So every time you talk to a Mormon, remember that. No prophecy of Scripture is of any what? Private interpretation. The Book of Mormon was written by Joseph Smith, a private interpretation. God used over 40 men, let's say 40 men, over a period of 1,600 years. I love that as a math major because 40 times 40 is 16 or 1,600. So he used 40, 40 different authors, 1,600 years to write this book that we have. And it has stood the test of time. So, no private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were what? Moved by the Holy Spirit. Now, this is important as I come into the the, the book of Proverbs. Because the book of Proverbs was predominantly written by Solomon. But it wasn't Solomon. The Holy Spirit was moving Solomon. That's a big deal to me. Very big deal to me. Because Solomon was the guy who introduced Israel in a mighty way to the sinful practice of idolatry. He began the practice where they would actually fall. And yet when he became king and God gave him a vision and and God spoke to him in a dream, he says... Ask for whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. And Solomon said what? Wisdom. I'm so young. 
And here I am to, 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 to guide this great people. Who am I to do this? I need wisdom. And God says, fine, I'll give you that. And he made him the wisest, we're told, the wisest man ever. And yet he didn't walk in that wisdom. And yet we're going to read in the book of Proverbs that he tells his son, Rechaboam, who's important, right? He tells his son, Rechaboam, listen, my son, to the words which I'm speaking. But the sad thing is that Rechaboam didn't listen to his words. He watched his life. And when Solomon passed away, Rechaboam became the next king. And it was in Rechaboam's day that the kingdom was divided because Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, came before him with the people and said, your father really tasked us hard. Will you please lighten the load? And as we look at the book of Proverbs, we'll see that, again, part of it even today is that a wise man is going to seek wise counsel, right? And so he went off and he sought the counsel of his father, and they gave him wise counsel. What did I say? His father's advisors. He got the counsel from his father's advisors. And they gave him wise counsel, but he rejected it and said, no, no, I'd rather listen to that of my peers, my friends, the fools that I hang out with. And the kingdom was then divided. Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Again, anustos means it is God breathed. It has been breathed out by God through those holy men that he used in his profitable doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be what? Complete. God gave us this book. Think about this. That we can be what? What's the word? Complete. Do you honestly truly believe that you can become complete by reading only this word? Or do you think that you need or that God needs the help of man to complete it? This is a real challenge. God spoke this word through holy men in order that the man of God, not the woman of God, just the man, Anyways, I knew you were thinking that, so I just wanted to know. Anyways, Anthropos, the people of God, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly, what? Equipped. Thoroughly equipped for what? Every, not just good works, but every good work. That we can be complete, and we can be thoroughly equipped. Now, again, I believe that God has a purpose for the prophets, evangelists, um, Let's see. The apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the equipping of the saints into the work of the ministry. I, I get that. However, I promise you that you lived on an island alone and all you had was this book. You'd have enough to be thoroughly equipped and be complete. This is, I mean, again, I've shared this many times. I don't read commentaries. I really believe God meant what he said. Do I have them? Yeah, if I'm going out in left field, I'll, I'll look at things just to, to challenge myself to make sure I'm not going way out there and left field too far. But as a whole, this is what, this is, what is going to make me complete. This is by which I'm going to be thoroughly furnished. God has promised me that he gave me the Holy Spirit, not only to seal me, but to lead me into all truth. That's his word. Your word is truth. And so, as we read this book, this book of Proverbs, as we study it, and as we look at it, there is so much truth that is in it that we are going to be considering. Now, we're going to have to study it a little bit differently than we've studied all the other books. Because all the other books, basically, you know, we did it in a, a purely expositional manner, working our way through the book. So, those books that were historical narratives, we did big chunks because we looked at the narratives that we want. Those that are, are doctrinal, theological, we did in smaller sections, you know. Either way, I preached a long time. So, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll take that one. <laughs> but as we come into Proverbs, Proverbs, once we get past the first couple chapters, is written 
thematically verse by verse by verse by verse by verse. So clearly we're not going to do a verse by verse by verse by verse by verse analysis of Proverbs. It would take forever. It would far surpass this seven to eight year going through the Bible that we've been, we've been doing. And so we're going to consider this thematically, but as we consider it thematically, we're also going to consider it then expositionally and exegetically. Okay, we're going to look at all those verses together that, that talk about that, and we're going to seek to break them through. Now, fortunately, we have a good transition point here because the first couple chapters are, in a sense, um, historical or narrative or doctrinal in a, in a sense. And so we're going, to, we're going to go into this and look at that, okay? So today we want to look at just seven verses. Really, we're going to look at just six of these seven verses and then look at the, the, the other verse next week or at least half of that verse next week is really what's going to happen. We're just going to look at the fear of the Lord next week. And so, I know, I actually could take these seven verses and, and, and spend a year on them. Anyways, but to me, this par- portion of Proverbs, as we get into it, is critical then for us to understand the importance of why we ought to be doing this study. Okay, Solomon immediately tells us, beginning in verse 2, what the purpose was in him writing these Proverbs. Now, understand that many of these Proverbs were gathered together um, in King Hezekiah's day uh, later. And so these writings of Proverbs, or writings of Solomon in his Proverbs, were being collected by people, okay? And I think we're, we were told, um, when we did Song of Solomon, we looked at this from Second Kings, that he had over 3,000 Proverbs. Clearly, they're not all recorded here, but many of them are. Okay, and so why aren't all of them there? Good job, Chuck. That's exactly right. The Holy Spirit decided we didn't need all of them. The Holy Spirit gave which ones he wanted us to know. And what's really kind of cool about this is he put them in the order that he wanted us to know them. So when you keep thinking about, didn't I read that two chapters ago? Maybe it's because you needed to what? You read it again. That's exactly right. So as I go into this, I want to remember this as well. This is a challenge that I'm going to give you hopefully at the end if I remember as well. If you do not currently or never have, okay, so I mean, so, I, mean I know I've done this and I'm not necessarily at this very moment, but every once in a while I go back and I do this, okay? But if you've never done this, I want you to make a commitment today to do this because today is May 31st. Tomorrow is June 1st. There are 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. A chapter, a chapter of Proverbs a day keeps the devil away. Anyways, uh, anyways, I don't know if that's necessarily positively true, but it's a good, th- it's a good statement, okay? But a, Proverbs, a chapter of Proverbs a day will help you growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to challenge you that each day that you read that chapter of Proverbs, along with whatever else you're doing, okay? So you don't have to write a thesis on it, okay? So when I go through it and I'm doing my quiet time through Proverbs, clearly I am, you know, I I just have to pick a verse or I pick a theme coming through that chapter that I want to focus on that, okay? And I trust the Holy Spirit and praying, Lord, what is it that you want me to get from this chapter today, okay? Because a lot of times in some of those chapters, there's what? A lot of different concepts that are going on. And so I can't focus on all those. But God is going to use one of those in your life. And I promise you that he will, if you really want him to do it. Okay? So you have to have that willing heart that you want God to be using this. So I just challenge you, if you've never done that, start doing it. And try to commit yourself to doing it for six months. Okay? So if I was Dr. Steve, I would have my prescription pad, right? And I would take my prescription pad out, and I would tell you to take one a day for six months, and I would give it to you. Now, think about that. If I was a doctor, and you came to me because you had a physical ailment, and I told you you need to do this, would you do that? Probably so. Unless you're really anti-doctor, and then you'd go back and you'd analyze it and say, I don't know, Steve, I don't know if I want to. Anyways, but as a whole, we'd do that. Why don't we do that in the spiritual realm? So I want to challenge you to do that. Okay, so the purpose. First of all, 
um, to know. Now, he's going to give us four, four purposes of why he, he um, wrote this, okay? What Proverbs are good for. First of all, so in verse 2, to know wisdom, and it says instruction, okay? But you're going to see that I have, it's to know wisdom and discipline. Discipline. Now, the word yada in the Hebrew is the word to know, but you're gonna, we're gonna, you're gonna, there's going to be a lot of words here, okay? And this is going to be sort of semi-technical, okay? And so, but the word yada is more of a word to know, not necessarily intellectually, but more relationally, okay? It has a lot of that into it. But so, for example, Adam yada Eve, and she gave birth to a son, okay? So, yada. Now, an interesting little fact is if, I, I never watched this show, but I think this came from Steinfeld or Seinfeld or whatever his name was. And that is the yada, yada, yada. But it was Jewish. I know, I know, I know. That's what it meant. So when you, say, when you hear someone say, ah, yada, 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 it's I know, I know, I know. Anyways, so, but yada is to know. So to know in an intimate way, well, what to know in an intimate way? To know wisdom. Wisdom. Now, chokmah is interesting because it, what it really means is it's an applied Knowledge, okay? The idea, so I am a math major, right? Well, technically I am, but really my degree is in applied mathematics. I am not a theoretical mathematician. If if you understand the difference between those, it's massive, okay? I'm not into all the the Greek letters on the the board with the, the math things, okay? I like to know what is it practically used for. Does that make sense? So, but that's what wisdom is. Wisdom is applied knowledge. See, a lot of people got knowledge. They have intellect, but they don't know how to apply it, how to use it. That's exactly right. And that's what wisdom is. Wisdom is then not just having the knowledge, but knowing how to use it. Okay? Usually in the Old Testament, it's coupled with the, the uh, two Hebrew words, bein and da'ath. We're going to see those words in just a moment, bein and, and da'ath. Bein is the word for understanding, and da'ath is the word for knowledge. And so we see this um, through in the uh, Old Testament, and these are the predominant areas that we see it. First of all, Joseph. Joseph had great wisdom. And in, in these individuals, what you're going to note here is that have wisdom, it tends to be that this wisdom comes from God. That the Spirit of God came upon somebody and gave them wisdom. That this wisdom didn't come from within themselves. It wasn't a man-generated thing. It was a God-generated thing. So Joseph, when he was in Egypt, told, told um, uh, Pharaoh to look out for someone who had, um, I think it was Bain, understanding in chokmah, wisdom. And Pharaoh looked at him and said, (laughs) nobody else could do this, so it apparently must be you. And then he was stated that the spirit of the gods was with Joseph as well. Bezalel and Aholiab. Does anybody know who Bezalel and Aholiab were? They they built, well, in a sense, yeah. So the Ark of the Testimony. Yeah, yeah, Noah built the Ark. And so the Ark of the Testimony. And so the tabernacle. So whether they literally themselves built everything or whether they designed everything and oversaw everybody, that God gave them the wisdom to know how to do these things. And then he also brought along women to help with making the tapestries and stuff. And he put wisdom in them. This is pretty cool, huh? The elders of the tribes, the leaders of the, of the people, the elders if you would, so bring that into the church, were supposed to be ones in whom they were filled with wisdom. Israel, in the book of Deuteronomy, was told to walk in wisdom, and that wisdom would come from the law of God, that God's law was going to be the origin of them having wisdom, so that all the other nations around about them would look at them, and they would be astounded in wonder where they got such great wisdom. And they would have that great wisdom because they were following the law of Yahweh. And then Solomon. 
who again, God promised that he would give them this chokmah. And so he then records it for us as well. Secondly, discipline. Now, this is a big word to me um, because it's musar. And I think we, it's mistranslated um, in our English translations as instruction. It primarily, so it's mit yasar, okay? And so you can see that down here I have that is really where it comes from, mit yasar. And it literally means with chastisement, okay? It means to chasten is what musar means, okay? And so, um, and so the idea of discipline, we take discipline as a negative term, but discipline is not a negative term. In fact, the word disciple comes from the, that same root, okay? And so a discipline is a training, it's a teaching. And so in, it can be positive or it can be negative, okay? But it's still the goal is teaching and training to discipline. So it used to be that we would tell young men that when they graduated from high school, that the first place they needed to go was where? Into the military. Why? They would learn discipline. They would learn discipline. Do you know what the, 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 the ninth of the fruit of the Spirit is? Self-control or self-discipline. Being able to discipline or control yourself is, is the idea there, okay? And so, Musar, again, is used 30 out of 50 times in the book of Proverbs. Clearly, we'll probably be talking about this word a lot as we go along, okay? We'll talk about it a little bit more as we go. Secondly, it's to understand, and literally, this is Habiyan uh, Emir Bina. And so, literally, to understand words of understanding, okay? And so you have in here to perceive the words of understanding, but literally it's to understand. It's the same word. To understand words of understanding. And so to grow in your ability to comprehend. So again, if you want to be able to understand these words of understanding, read the book of Proverbs. It's amazing, again, how elucidated, is that the right word, that you illuminated, that you can, can become to understand things just by reading God's Word. I want to step back and give it another illustration. When I went to college, um, and this isn't a pat, pat, pat on my back. This is just, this is reality. When I went to high school, I was a scholar, okay? I was top 10%, whatever, in Pittsburgh schools. That's how I was able to get into Carnegie Mellon. That wasn't my senior year. My senior year, I went off and I did wrongful stuff and yada, 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 and my senior year grades were... <laughs> down. But it didn't matter because you're accepted based upon all your junior year stuff, right? And so I got my army scholarship and all that kind of stuff based, based upon junior year. I went to Carnegie Mellon and I really wanted to study um, because I didn't have to when I was in, in the public schools in the city. And so, um, and so I went there and I, and, and I, I flunked with royal colors in my, my, my first semester. Like really, really bad. And, and so um, but the Army was gracious, and they gave me um, extensions on my, my scholarship. And so the next semester, I was able to do better, and I pulled up my, my, my GPA. Anyways, so I wound up having a B average in the end um, from a Carnegie Mellon. But I, I only went to get a diploma. I didn't really go to learn. Does that make sense? And I struggled, 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 struggled with trying to learn, trying to understand. You got to understand, I have five years of German. Ich habe fünf Jahre in die Schule. Okay? And so, but that's good because I practice that line. So you can know that I do that, you know? Ich habe, um, let's see, drei Jahre in der Elementary, ein, no, that's not. Ein Jahre in der Elementary, drei Jahre in der Hochschule, ein Jahre in der Universität. Now, the sad thing is that after four years of having German in elementary school and, and, and high school, when I went to college, I still was just a little bit over my beginner German. You get what I'm saying? Okay. In other words, I wasn't a rocket scientist. Okay. But when I went to seminary, and so they were, Dr. Garber was really worried when I went to seminary, looking at me like, oh, man, you know, you got to be average, and here you want to take a, more than full load coming into seminary. You know, I only had three years of money coming in from the Army. I was like, this is what I'm doing. And so... Um, but when I went into seminary, here's the difference. I ate it up. I mean, straight, I, I think I had one B. It was Israel. 
I went on vacation to Israel and I got a B. How do you get, how do you get a B for vacation? Anyways, so um, I ate it up. I ate up seminary. What was the difference? I was interested, but I now had a daily routine of reading and studying the Word of God. I'd memorized multiple books of the Bible. Do you get it? Again, it's not being proud of myself, okay? This is just the reality. God's Word is, is true. I promise you, if you follow what God has asked you to do, it's amazing what God will accomplish in you. Not you yourself, but God accomplishing in you. To understand understanding. I get it. Because there was a whole lot of understanding I didn't understand. I, yeah, I didn't get it. It's to be able to get the getting stuff, you know, and I didn't get it. But now I look out in the world and I think to myself, what aren't you people getting? Well, they're not understanding. Why? Because they don't have the understanding. That can be judgmental. I don't mean that. Thirdly, to receive. The word lachak is to, to take or receive. Now, in the, um, in the Greek, there is, for those who've taken Greek, okay, it's the word lambano. Lambano means to take or receive. There's the word dekomai that more is receive, but lambano is to take or receive. And so lachak is the same way. And so if I, if I went like this to Marcia, the question is, is she taking it or is she receiving it? Does that make sense? In a sense, I'm extending it so she's receiving it, but there's a part where she had to reach out her hand and what? Take it. So there's two sides that are involved in this, okay? And so the idea here is to receive, but also that to take. That God is offering. God is offering this to you, but you have to what? you got to take it. I mean, it's like the gift of salvation. It's sitting under the Christmas tree, if you would, with your name on it. And there's a package for everybody in the entire world. He's not the propitiation for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. God, when Jesus came to the earth, he died for the sins of the whole world. That gift is there waiting for every single individual. All they got to do is take it. It's being offered. It's being extended. They just have to receive it. Wisdom is here for us to receive. To receive the discipline, if you would, of understanding. And so I'm putting the word discipline in here. Okay, you can see in verse 3, it says to receive the instruction. Again, that's the word musar. Okay, so think discipline. But also then think, if you want, if you want to go to the negative side, correction. Correction in here, okay? Because a lot of times it's the concept of being corrected. We learn best when we what? Make mistakes. That's exactly right. We don't really learn a lot when things go well. But when things go wrong, we kind of pay attention to this and we go, oh, what, what, what? So, correction. So, the discipline or correction of understanding. Jeremiah, this is, we read this a week or two ago, um, remember in 2 Corinthians when we're looking at that, it says, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me that I am Yahweh, okay? And so this is the, Sekel is the idea of comprehending something, okay? To comprehend it. And so there is the, the correction or the discipline then of comprehending or understanding. Secondly, there's the discipline of righteousness, the deck, okay? And so you have the word um, justice there, but literally the word deck is the word for righteousness, okay? And so righteousness is that which is right in God's eyes. That's exactly right. Not in man's eyes, but in God's eyes. There is a whole lot of quote-unquote self-righteousness being played out in, on the stage today. Everybody is debating what is right, but it's according to their own definition of what is right. This contains the only definition of truly what is right. And so many times I fail this definition. And my loving Heavenly Father does what? He musars me. He corrects me. Sometimes in Hebrews chapter 12 tells me that if I don't listen to the verbal musar, if I don't listen to the verbal correction, he has to what? Give me the, the, the physical. The board of education is applied to the seat of learning, right? 
You kids get that, right? Okay. That happened to me in life too, you know. But God still does it. If you, if, you, if you pay attention, God's still applying the Board of Education to the seat of learning when we don't listen to the words of Musar. And so, the discipline of righteousness, Psalm 18, verses 20 and 21 says, Yahweh rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, for he has recompensed me, for I have kept the ways of Yahweh and have not wickedly departed from my God. So, according to David, what was the definition of quote unquote righteousness? Walking according to the ways of, of Yahweh. Okay? Thirdly, to receive the discipline of justice. Okay, and note again the word up there is meshafat. Okay, now every again, hopefully I do this enough that some of you, even if you don't know Hebrew, okay, so that just means Gerard and I, right? So, anyways, so everybody else, you're picking up on some of these prefixes, right? So when there's an M in front of the word, what does the M mean? <sighs> with, with. Okay, now I can have some other, but primarily it's with. Okay. So, Ms. Shafat, it's with Shafat. So, the question is, what is Shafat? Shafat is a judge, okay? And so, or to judge, or to be the judge, okay? And so, Ms. Shafat is something that's with a judge, and so that is a judgment, okay? And so, or justice that is rendered by the, the judge. So, the discipline, the correction of justice. Now, the reality is, we understand that as children, okay, again, our mom and our dad are the what in the house? The judge and the jury. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, no, son. A lot of times the kids, and so when you have more and more kids, they think that the jury gets bigger and bigger. And it doesn't work that way, though, right? It's mom and dad are the judge and the jury. One can be the judge, the other one's the jury. They confirm. Okay, good. And so at that point, this decision is rendered, okay, and justice is served. Now, you may not agree, we'll come to that word next, okay? You may not agree with the justice or the judgment that was rendered, but it doesn't matter. It was rendered by the judge, and so therefore it is considered then as justice, okay? And so we see in Deuteronomy 16, verse 18, you shall appoint yourself judges, Shaphat, and officers in your gates, which Yahweh your God gives you according to your tribes, and they shall... Uh, judge you, the people with just tzedek, that's righteous, judgments, mitfashafat. So you're going to see that these three words, the tzedek, shafat, or mitfashafat, in our next word, are all going to go together. Okay? And so then there's the discipline of um, uprightness, mit yashar, and so the M means what? Yeah. With. You guys got it. Good. Okay. With yashar. And so yashar is fairness or straightness. Okay, and so it's to be fairness with fairness or straight. Now, the reality is, as we come through this, the, the, the concept of righteousness into justice into uprightness, we would like then the justice to be what? Rendered with righteousness and uprightness, that it would be fair and straight. Psalm 98, verse 9, for he is coming to judge Shaphat the earth with righteousness, Zedek, he shall judge Shaphat the world and peoples with equity, okay, or fairness. I've got to move quickly. To give is the last fourth of them. Natan as, uh, is a gift. So to give something as a gift. So like to receive. Okay. To take and receive. Well, this is to give like a gift. To give to the simple. Prudence. And I just want to point out real quickly this word simple is used 15 out of its 19 times in the book of Proverbs. And that literally you can look up these verses that I put there for you on your sermon note sheets. But it is as opposed to the foolish by intent. The only way you know the difference between someone who's silly and someone who's foolish is by their, their intent, okay? That someone who's silly looks pretty what? Foolish, and the foolish act very silly. But in God's word, the foolish evil um, is the word evil. They do things intentionally, okay? In prudence, the word or orma is subtlety or wiliness. It is, we're going to, a couple words here, um, that they have a negative and a positive um, connotation. It depends on the context in which it's being used. Okay? So um, as you look up some of the uses of it, you're going to find out that it's not used in a very good way. Okay? But, for example, like the Gibeonites in Joshua 9.4, what did they do? They deceived Israel. They deceived Joshua and the leaders, didn't they? Okay? Well, that was Ramah. 
from their perspective, it was great what? Prudence. Because what was getting ready to happen to them? They were getting ready to be wiped out. So if you were getting ready to be wiped out, you might consider, and you didn't know God, and so, you know, you, you did what you needed to do from the worldly perspective. They used great prudence in saving their skin. Make sense? All right? So, so that's the idea, and you can look this up. Matthew 10, 16 says that we are supposed to be in the world um, that wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Okay? That's the idea that is being used there. Okay? And so to the young man then, to give him knowledge and discretion, okay? Knowledge, again, is our word da'at that we talked about earlier for knowledge. Discretion is mitzma with planning or plotting. Again, it has an evil and a good sense. The evil sense is that it is um, mischievous devices. On the good sense, that it's wittiness and discretion, okay? So you get that from going God's word. I'm going to come back to this next week. We're going to begin with this next week, but I want to just leave this with this thought process here. All of that was important. These purposes were important because they are now defining into the summarized into this principle. Okay, the principle is going to be based upon this precept, and so it splits out. And so there's this um, um, literary device that's being used where you have the one part of um, the the principle here, you have the fulcrum, and then you have the second part of the principle. What's the principle? The wise will seek to learn. Wisdom, right? The wise will seek to learn wisdom. The fools will despise wisdom. So throughout all these things, God says, look, I'm giving Solomon this stuff in order for you to what? Come through those four purposes. To, to, to understand, to receive, to, to give, to... I'm messing them up. So to know, to know, to understand, to receive, and to give, and all these things, right? So you can be what? Wise. So, a wise man is going to what? He's going to heed it. He's going to go to it. He's going to hear it. He's going to increase learning. He's going to be, attain wise counsel in order that he can understand the proverb and enigma, the words of the wise and the riddles. But the fool, he's going to, he's going to read those first couple verses and he's going to say what? I know that stuff. So, how much time do you spend in reading God's word as opposed to reading the self-help information of man. Basically, we're boiling this down to who you really are. Are you the wise or are you the fool? And I'm not going to answer it for you. You have to answer it yourself. God has placed it out there pretty clearly. Those who seek after God's word are the, the wise. Those who reject the word of God are the, the foolish. If you haven't already, are you willing to commit yourself to reading a chapter of Proverbs every day? Remember I said I'm going to challenge you on that one. The wise will seek wisdom, the fool will despise wisdom. Which then are you? Is there a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you for the truth in it. I thank you that you have recorded wisdom that stands the test of time. Lord, help us. Help me. Lord, to daily seek your face, to seek your wisdom and instruction for my life. Lord, and help me not just to, so many times it's so easy to just become fat on your word, Lord. I don't want to become fat. I want to be lean. I want to be mean. I want to be a fighting machine. I want, I want to use your word to, to, to equip me, Lord, to serve you and to, to, to battle within this spiritual war that we're in the midst of. Lord, I pray the same for this assembly. Lord, that we would be faithful daily, spending not just quality time, but, Lord, quantity and quality time in your word, Lord, that um, we would be strengthened through it, and that we would be prepared, we would be ready, we would be equipped to give a defense to everyone who asks us a reason for the hope that's within us, that you might receive the glory in our lives individually, in our homes, and in this assembly. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.